Hello from Otago Library. My name is Daryl Sprout. My show is called Snake Encounters because you're about to encounter a whole bunch of snakes. Now this is a very, very, very unusual show for me at Otago Library because I've been coming here to do the summer reading program for many, many years. But this is the first time I've ever arrived at this library and the parking lot was empty. Why? Because this time we're doing it virtually. And it's very strange for me because usually I cause a complete parking shortage in the entire neighborhood. In fact, we usually pack the house to the point that it's more than the air conditioner can keep up with. So, at least you're nice and cool at home today. In fact, it's not even a very uh, warm day, is it? But, uh, but yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get through even though you're not going to hear people laughing at my jokes or screaming at my scary moments. All of my scary turns out to be funny anyway. But feel free to laugh and scream at home. So here we go. We're going to start small. We always start with the first question everybody always asks me, which is, of course, did he bring anything poisonous? Now, of course, at that point, I'll normally see what the crowd seems to respond with. But, of course, since there is no crowd, uh, I will say, yeah, well, I said it would start with that question. I did not say it would answer it yet. Then I'll say there are four kinds of venomous snakes in Texas. Does anybody think that includes cobras? Anybody at home? Nope, no cobras in Texas, except when some bozo lets one loose here. Some of your folks are going to remember there was a story about, ah, gosh, eight years ago now, I think. There was a cobra loose under a building near downtown Dallas. And there was an idiot, I mean an expert, that they sent under the building to go after it. We'll come back to that story. But no, what do we have in Texas that is venomous? I can already hear it. Rattlesnake, that's the first one I heard. What's next? Copperhead, very good, very good. I heard at least somebody say that. What's the one in the water? Water moxin, very good. Now, what's the last one? This is where people usually get stumped. What is the last one? Rattlesnakes, copperheads, water moccasins, and... By the way, one of the ways you can tell that somebody's into snakes, they have a lot more pillowcases than they have pillows. Yeah, what kind of Mickey Mouse operation is this anyway? Here we go, are you ready? Rattlesnakes, copperheads, really tight knot. Who did this? I'm sure it was me. Here we go, rattlesnakes, copperheads, water moccasins, and, I'm kidding. Sadly, I don't have a whole crowd here to give me a good blood curdling scream because I love a good blood curdling scream. But at any rate, no, this is not the fourth venomous snake. This is in fact a rat snake, which is why he is in a mouse bag. So here we go. This is one of my very favorite rat snakes. I take you to the far southern tip of southwest Texas, the Rio Grande, actually, not the Rio, well, it's not the Rio Grande Valley because that's the southern, southern tip of Texas. We're talking around Big Bend, the Trans-Pecos area. This is one of my favorite rat snakes, the Trans-Pecos rat snake. Isn't he cool? <laughs> now, actually, I don't know if I can get anywhere to get closer to you, but if you look at this face, this is the one of the most intelligent snakes. People don't think snakes are very smart. For the most part, they're right. Um, they, they do have a lot of specialized behavior, but this little guy is, you can tell, he's, he's thinking. He's, he's working it out. There are two other species of snakes that do that for me. One of them is the king cobra. That's a smart snake, which is a big problem because it's also the largest venomous snake in the world. And the other one is the reticulated python. And while he's not venomous, he's also the largest python in the world. And both of those, you can tell it. They can work things out. I have looked into those eyes and said this will not be a fun competition if it comes down to that. But yeah, this little guy's famous. Always just, when I was growing up, this was something I always wished I could find. I wished I could get that far down there to, to, to hunt for these. Um, these days, of course, it's become popular enough that they breed them in captivity, which is how I came across him. I named him after the uh, Indians of um, northern Mexico that are not far on the other side of the Rio Grande from him, which is the Yaqui Indians. His name is Yaqui, yeah. But uh, 
a beautiful trans Pecos rat snake. Now, what's good about a rat snake? <laughs> My audience is four people in here. <laughs> rat snakes eat rats. Feel free to uh, scream and yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for your polite applause. Um, rat snakes eat rats. Let me tell you how many in his lifetime. One rat snake can do $100,000 worth of pest control. Wow. Okay? Compared to paying the Orkin man for that many rats. Now, here around Wataga, we don't have the Trans Pecos rat snake. Not even close. But the one we have here is gray and lighter gray with dark gray blotches all the way down his back, right? And he will act all big and bad sometimes. He'll hiss at you, he'll strike at you, he'll may even rattle his tail. There's no rattle on the end of the tail, but if the leaves or the dry twigs sounds like the real thing, okay? But it's all bluff. All he does is eat rats. And seriously, there is never a good reason to kill a rat snake, ever. If you see a rat snake, I want you to do two things. I want you to leave him alone, and I want you to name him George. It's really hard to kill a snake once his name is George. It's also more easy to appreciate what George can do and what George is capable of, and to watch him climb a tree is amazing. George is an amazing climber. All right? So, if you see a rat snake, leave him alone and name him George. And the funny thing is, I've got an 800 number. When people have a snake problem, they can call me. <laughs> call it if you want, 339-9470, 800 But at any rate, people call me with their copperheads and their rattlesnakes and their water moccasins. And I say, take me a picture. <laughs> and I give them my cell phone number. And inevitably it turns out to be the local rat snake. And so I give them the same advice I just gave you. And I've been doing it for so long that because of me, there are several hundred rattlesnakes in this country named George. Not rattlesnakes, rat snakes. So, so at any rate, let's hear it for Yaki. Doesn't matter, he can't hear it anyway. You know, snakes have no ears. Did you know that? No. Check it out, check it out. The next snake, I'll get him out of the box the way they do on TV. There we go. Watch carefully. Pretend that I have a towel in my head. Uh-oh. Hmm. Pretend that that's not missing. Maybe I'm supposed to be waving back and forth. You're waiting for something to happen, aren't you? Nothing's going to happen. Snakes have no ears. Doesn't matter what you're playing, the snake can't hear the flute. Now, the snake on the cobra on TV that's waving back and forth, the flute's waving back and forth. He's just following the motion. It has nothing to do with the song. You could be playing Van Halen, it would make no difference. You guys don't know who Van Halen is. You know who Led Zeppelin was? Led Zeppelin invented the wheel. Good boy. Right. So here we go. What else do I have in here? Oh, what's the first word that comes to your mind when I say the word boa? Constrictor. Constrictor, right? All boas are constrictors, but not all boas are boa constrictors. But I have to tell you the most creative answer I ever got to that question. I said, what's the first word that comes to your mind when I say the word boa? One little kid said narrow. Boa narrow. I'm not making this up. Oh, by the way, if you're wondering why the king, yes, um, I bought it way back when at a Ren Fest because I liked it at the time. As they would have it, as I got older, I began to need it. Sad thing is, every time I carry it, people tell me I look like house. <laughs> Makes me want to trip them with it. Anyway, let's talk about boas. Not all boas are really big. In fact, this one is in this bag. Yes, not only that, it's a grown-up boa. And not only that, boas are mostly New World animals, which means Central and South America, right? right? But this one actually comes from the United States. There are only two boas that live here. They live in very, very small parts. Uh, uh, one of them lives in San Diego County. The other one lives on a little bitty spot of... Um, uh, 
the western coast of California, a bit further north, I forget exactly where, but that's what this is. This is called a rosy bow. Isn't she adorable? <laughs> yep, yep. I call her rosy, which seems a little bit obvious, but how many people have a rosy boa anyway? You know. Now, of course, everybody and their brother has a ball python named Monty, but that's another story. <laughs> but yeah, it, it just rosy seemed right. And she does have a rosy disposition, don't you? She's a good girl. She's just a total little sweetheart. But yeah, that's a, that's a full grown adult rosy boa. A boa that lives in the United States. Very, very unusual stuff. So yeah, let's hear it for Rosie. Yay! So what else we have in here? Oh, hey, <laughs> you didn't actually see the fourth venomous snake, did you? He said rattlesnakes, copperheads, water moccasins. What's the fourth one? Does anybody know? Anybody know? No, we don't know. <laughs> here we go. Who knows what these are for? Grabbing a snake. These are for snakes that need to be over there. Yeah, you see, I do a show called Snake Encounters for libraries and museums and festivals and scout troops and, oh gosh, um, birthday parties. <laughs> but I also do snake removal. When somebody's got a snake problem, I'm the guy who has to climb under the house or through the attic and remove the snake so that mom will move out of the hotel room and back into the house. And when I'm crawling around on my tummy going after a snake that's faster on his tummy than I am on mine, I like to keep the snake over there. Now, I only use this on the really dangerous ones. The fourth venomous snake is, in fact, the Texas coral snake. Do you want to see what he looks like? Yeah. You want to see what he looks like? Yeah. He looks like this. <laughs> I almost got my blood curdling scream. Yes, this is a Taiwanese vinyl snake. Oh, for an audience to hear that joke. At any rate, yes, he's to I would never put a real coral snake in my show. That would be very, very mean. Coral snakes are incredibly fragile. They are the most venomous snake we have, but they're also the most reclusive and the hardest to keep alive. They, they want to hide under stuff. They eat smaller snakes. They're very, very difficult to keep alive. I would never put a real coral snake through the rigors of traveling with me and doing my show. That would be mean. But at least he's anatomically correct, so you can see the little rhyme, right? Red and yellow. Anybody know? He's a good fellow. Red, no, that's not a good fellow. He's a bad fellow. It is a good fellow, but still. Red and yellow, kill a fellow. Oh. Red and black, then I'm black. Safe for Jack, no need to jump back, don't have an attack. So if this red is touching the black, the problem is this is not 100%. In fact, all you got to do is go into uh, Central and South America and you can find a coral snake where the red touches a black. In fact, you can find one that doesn't even have any yellow. You know what I mean? So it's, it's not that airtight. But here in the United States, yeah, it works. And here in Watauga, if you're in, Co I mean, we're in uh, Tarrant County, right? We, if you're in Tarrant County or Dallas County or Collin County or Rockwell County, if you're around here and you see a snake that looks like this, don't bother with the run, all right? You're too far west for the Louisiana milk snake. You're too far north for the Mexican milk snake, and you're too far east for everything else that mimics this. So if it's around here and it looks like this, it's a coral snake. So what do you do when you see it? Back away slowly. Back away slowly. I like that. Usually people say run. I'm say run is good. Run is over. Kill but run will do. Try not to run into any trees. Does anybody think you should tell a grown up? Yes. Usually the worst thing you can do. Yeah, well, venom is not meant for self-defense. Venom is meant for lunch. It's meant for getting lunch. They only use it in self-defense when something tries to kill them, like some crazy grown-up with a shovel. All right? Eight out of ten people who are bitten by venomous snakes are trying to kill the snake at the time. And the other two had just said, hey, y'all, watch this. So, <laughs> unless the grown-up really knows what they're doing, I would rather you not call the grown-up. Just take two steps back and go play somewhere else. The fastest snake in Texas goes six miles an hour. A human who has seen the snake can easily do 15. He will not chase you down. He will also not grab his tail in his mouth and roll down a hill like a hoop at you. There's a lot of people in Texas who still believe in a hoop snake. There is no such thing as a hoop snake. I'll give you another one. How many of you have ever seen a garden snake? Yeah, well, there's no such thing as a garden snake. 
And there's definitely no such thing as a garden, a gardener snake. What is that, a snake with a rake? <laughs> so grown-ups don't answer this. No grown-ups, tell me kids. What exactly, would I have one kid here? Tell me, what exactly is this? A garden. I said no grown-ups. <laughs> the crowd isn't listening. <laughs> My crowd of four. Um, <laughs> yes, it's a garter. What does a garter do? Holds things up. <laughs> At least you didn't say it guards things. That's what kids usually guess. Now, yeah, no, what it used to hold up was stockings. That's why you see one of these on the bride's leg at a wedding, because it used to be they wore long stockings before they invented nylon that stays up by itself. And under a long dress where you never saw it was a garter holding up each stocking. Now the garter has a stripe down the middle. Back in the day when ladies wore garters all the time, the snake with a stripe down the middle was named after this. It's called a garter snake. So the snake in the garden is not a garden snake. The snake in the grass is not a grass snake. There's a grass snake all over Europe, but there is no grass snake in the United States. That little brown snake in your grass looks like an earthworm. You know what he eats? Earthworms. And he's called a rough earth snake. There's a green one that climbs up in the vines. You know what they call him? A rough green snake. <laughs> so yeah, you get the pattern. But no, there is no grass snake in this country. There is no garden snake, period. Let's see. Oh, another thing. If you ask somebody in Texas, how do I tell if the snake... By, by the way, did you know there's no such thing as a poisonous snake? Mm -hmm. Venomous. That's right. If the snake is venomous, I'm in trouble if he bites me. If he is poisonous, I'm in trouble if I bite him. Yes. That's right. Snakes are not poisonous. Snakes taste like chicken. But no, uh, if you ask somebody in Texas, how do I tell if it's venomous or not, They'll all tell you to look at the shape of what? And that's wrong. Because, look, here's the most venomous snake we have. That's anatomically correct. Look at that little bitty head. But a lot of snakes with wide triangle heads are harmless. Most of the snakes in the water in Texas are not water moccasins. They're water snakes, but they got a wide triangle head. Yet they're harmless. The rat snake, we were just talking about George. George has a wide triangle head, but he's harmless and beneficial. Very beneficial. So forget the shape of the head. I want you to look at the shape of the body. Because you see, the other three, this, the coral snake is the only one in the United States, this only works in the United States, by the way. This is the only one here that is long and skinny and is also venomous. The other three, the rattlesnake, the copperhead, and the water moccasin, that did not get a scream, but you'll notice he is not long and skinny, he's short and fat. Seriously, this is an accurate depiction of a water moccasin. And you'll notice he's not really, really long. The really long snakes in the water are almost always water snakes. The really long water moccasins are incredibly, incredibly rare. But you'll notice, long and skinny, short and fat. It's really that easy. Unless it's a coral snake, long and skinny is good, short and fat is bad. They're like supermodels. Right? So two steps back, go play somewhere else. Now what else? Do I have one more thing in here? I do. Let's talk about pipe. This. Not all pythons are really big either. Check it out. It's in this bag. She's in this bag. Come on, girl. She's such a sweetheart. Boy. I guess I was being uh, thorough when I tied my knots this morning. Here we go. Come on, girl. From northern Australia and southern New Zealand, the spotted Python. Isn't she gorgeous? She's totally gentle too. She's an absolute sweetheart. Now, you can't really quite see it in here. This is one of many um, species of either python or boa that are iridescent. If we were outside in the sun, you'd get little rainbows coming off of her. There's actually a boa called the rainbow boa. And in the right lighting, I mean, it's more rainbows than pattern, it seems. So, yeah. So, she's a little bit iridescent. She's incredibly gentle. And that's one of the things that's sad about this particular um, lack of a crowd. I can't really hand her. Some kids say, look, check it out. But um, for those of you that are at home cringing about me holding this animal, first of all, she's not slimy. There are no slimy snakes. There are slimy uh, amphibians. There are slimy fish. The snakes have no slime layer. Okay, so she's very smooth, very clean. She's also as gentle as a lamb. I mean, I could do this all day and <laughs> she'd be fine with it. 
Um, so, um, yeah, in fact, I would say this is accessorized. But uh, at any rate, yeah, yeah, accessories that don't move are sold last year. So, uh, at any rate, let's hear it for the Spotted Python. <laughs> No, she has a rather interesting name. Comes from a plant species. I did not actually name her, um, and so um, I, uh, I think I'll tell you that name after the show. It'll make sense to you then. Yeah, yeah. So who's next? Let's see here. What do you call a snake with legs? A politician. Actually, another good answer would be lizard, and usually I used to bring, in fact, a lot of people who've come to this library will remember a really big lizard that I had. Um, he was a big rock star, but I mean, I always adopt adults, and they only live so long. I mean, that particular species only lived to be about 13, 14. I don't know how old he was when I got him. But no, he was not, you know, an iguana. He was uh, not a Komodo dragon. He was certainly not some gecko who's constantly going on about saving you money on insurance. But no, he was a, um, a black and white tig. But no, I don't have a lizard in the show, show right now. But there's another reptile that is not a snake. What would that be? Say hello to Turbo. Oh, oh. <laughs> Turbo is in Arizona tortoise, painted tortoise. He's got this really cool paint thing on his back. Um, he's interesting to hold because if you hold him, he'll hold you. He's like, I don't want to ball. <laughs> he's a good boy. The thing I tell people is, one, don't let it freak you out when he, when he holds onto your fingers that hard. But two, don't let him taste the finger he will. And he's got a pretty good jaw pressure. So it's not like he's really trying to hurt you. It's just, that's what he would do. <laughs> Let's hear it for a turbo! What a good boy. <laughs> cool thing about turbo is he's the closest thing to a vegetarian I have with, with uh, reptiles. It's not that he's really a vegetarian, but he does like a little salad, a little chopped salad. He, um, his favorite is organic blueberries. He goes nuts for organic blueberries. And uh, he reminds me of Capone in that he won't eat a conventional strawberry. It must be organic or he won't eat it. Yeah. They say that of all uh, fruits, the strawberry is the most organic, uh, the most important to eat organic because the pesticides they use in traditional uh, or conventional farming completely infuse the fruit. You can't wash them enough to get them clean. So remember that. All right, so here we go. Who's next? Oh, I know who's next. Let's talk about pythons again. Here's where things get weird. Oh, wait a minute. First of all, I have to show you something our librarian brought me. Because there's one more thing about how to tell if a snake is venomous or not. You guys want to see it? All right. Sometimes people will tell you that you want to look at, well, see what I mean. Okay. I'm going to draw a pair. Uh, snake eyes. No, we're not rolling dice. And here we have one snake eye, and here we have another. Which one is venomous? The left one. This one? No, the other one. This one. That's correct. Why? Yeah, but why does a vertical pupil mean venomous? Why would that be? Which one hunts at night? Same one, right? And all of our pit vipers, which is rattlesnakes, copperheads, and water moccasins, they're pit vipers. They see in the dark. They see heat. They see infrared. So they hunt at night primarily, which is why this is the pupil that means venomous. But there's problems with this. First of all, to make use of it, you have to get down on your hands and knees and look the snake squarely in the eye. This is foolproof if you're fool enough to use it. Actually, it's not even foolproof because the problem is if it's dark out, this eye opens quite wide and looks very round. Now there's one more thing about this particular image. Something that most people don't recognize at first. Because this is actually a single snake 
suffering from multiple personality disorder. Yeah, well, it's a whole lot easier to get a laugh when there's more than four people. Anyway, so, thank you, librarian, for the dry erase mark. <laughs> Where was I? Oh, pythons. Back to pythons. Here we go. For our next python, we go to Australia. That's right, this is the Australian jungle carpet python. See what they call him a copy python? Then he looked like the lobby of a cheap hotel. Actually, but there's a thing with him. He's friendly, but he's spastic. I, I think, I, I, of course, I always adopt adults, but I seriously think somebody did something to him that caused brain damage because he can never decide where he's going. In fact, the only thing that ever seems to make him <laughs> settle down is to give him, if I can, come here, there you go, a place to climb. Because you see, this particular species lives up in the trees. It's a very arboreal snake. It lives up in the trees, spends all its life up there a lot of times. It'll drink the, uh, the water off the, the, uh, the leaves when it rains. You're really squishing my hat. And he will, um, He's fast enough to catch a bird as it flies by, which means those teeth are quite long. So it's very fortunate for me that even though he's spastic as all get out, he doesn't want to bite me. So he's actually a, um, a, a good boy. He's a friendly animal. He's just completely out of his mind. Um, sometimes we just call him Spaz. Although because he's a carpet python, his real name is Shag. At any rate, let's see what it takes to get him off of my head. Um, hello. Thank you. And then the hard part is getting him back in the box. Because you see, while he's all <laughs> over the place, it's hard to even tell him the box is where we're going. And and the trick is you got to get the tail yeah, you got to get the tail in the box before the head comes out. And it is not as easy as it looks. In the box. You're not helping. Here we go, here we go. One, two, three. Down, boy. Flash hair for the garbage button. So, you still haven't met anything venomous yet, have you? Do you want to? Yes! Now I need you quiet because I need you to identify a sound for me. <laughs> By the way, we got a lot of cool books here. This one's called Everything You Need to Know About Snakes and Other Scaly Reptiles. That's a little bit of a thin book to make that claim with if you ask me, but I like the book. Good stuff here at the library. Check it all out. So, here we go. Tell me what this sound means. Oh, wait a minute. For this, I'll need this. Wakey, wakey. That, oh. that or a really cool sound effect, huh? He's from Venezuela. His name is Jesus. But most people, when they see him, pronounce it the other way. From Venezuela, the Venezuelan rattlesnake. Oh, wow. Yep, that's the real deal. Oop, easy now, boy. You know how to do this. Now, you notice his rattle's not all that long. That doesn't mean he's young. It means it broke off at some point in his adulthood. has been slowly growing back. And so uh, when he sheds, a lot of his sheds create one more nub. But the deal is, or one more segment, but that doesn't mean you can tell the snake's age by his, uh, you know, the size of his rattle. In fact, um, the the babies are shedding, you know, s s as much as every couple of months. The grown-ups are shedding as rarely as three or four times a year. So you can't really do it with that. Now you know what he means when he rattles his tail, right? It means you're too big to eat, go away. 
In his world, everything too big to eat is big enough to be eaten by. Everything in the wild eats snakes. Dogs, cats, bears, birds of prey, possums, armadillos, people. He tastes like chicken. So he's saying, back off, you're too big to eat. I think he's also trying to tell me that he doesn't like my breath. So does everybody see him? Yes. Good, let's hear it for Jesus. Woo! Somehow I'm always happy when that part happens. Or when it's over. Now, what do we got in here? You know, one of the things that I, uh, I do to help tell my story, and I don't know if you've started to notice what my story is. My story is don't kill the snakes, all right? Even a venomous snake, it's far better to leave it alone and let it go its way. If you've got to get it to go its way faster, you can use a water hose, stay away from the animal. He doesn't want to bite you. The venom is not meant for you. It's meant for getting lunch. And if you do make the mistake of trying to kill it and you get bit, that is a $50,000 mistake in this country, all right? This is probably the worst, well, this is the worst place by far, expense-wise, to get bit by a bit of a snake, even though a lot of other countries have snakes that are way more venomous than ours are. Go figure. So at any rate, um, my message is don't kill the snake, but it's more than that, because I'm really trying to save the world. Um, one snake at a time, in a sense, because in my lifetime, almost 80% of the wildlife on this planet, all of it, is gone. And which species is responsible? Ours. And the only way to turn that tide is for all of us to stop killing things that we don't understand. Because if you got some of the food chain, you got all of the food chain. You start poking holes in that, you mess up the whole balance, which is exactly what's happening out there. So don't kill the snake. And there's a whole lot of other things you don't have to kill. I'll give you an example. You know you don't even have to kill fire ants? I'm serious. You don't have to put poison in your yard for fire ants. You can spread, what is it? Dry molasses. Dry molasses. You can buy it at the restaurant supply. You put it out 20 pounds per square foot. No, 20 pounds per thousand square feet. There you go. <laughs> um, and the funny thing is, it, 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 it's not even poisonous at all to them. Uh, it, it's fertilizer, really. But for some reason, the fire ants hate it. So they move into your neighbor's yard where they belong. All right? So for every toxic pesticide or chemical fertilizer, there's an alternative that nourishes the biological activity in the soil. And happy soil means happy plants, and happy plants mean happy everything. Okay? So don't muck with the food chain. Now, one of the things I do to help tell my story, and of course the story is, you know, please don't kill the, the, the wildlife, um, sometimes I'll use magic. Would you like to see me pull a rabbit out of this hat? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, all my rabbits are at home in my freezer. Oh. True story. <laughs> right next to the mice and rats. Yes, the, uh, the last time... Uh, a girlfriend left me. I said, why are you leaving me? And she gave me a long list, but the top of the list was my freezer. <laughs> she really hated thawing day. But the thing is, you never want to feed a snake in captivity a live animal, in my opinion. That's a life and death struggle they don't have to go through. And the snake will get pretty quickly um, used to the fact that the animal doesn't fight back. Now, sometimes you have to sort of tease it in front of him a little bit to where he knows it's something to eat. Um, but we'll come back to that subject because I have an interesting idea in mind that I've never done in a show before. But uh, at any rate, no, I'm not going to pull a rabbit out of this hat. But yeah, it's true. Um, you know how they say nice guys finish last? Nice guys who drop a van full of snakes finish after them. So single moms. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so. You want to pull it, see me pull a snake out of this hat? Yes. Yeah. All right. First of all, you have to see that the hat is empty. It wouldn't be impressive if the hat had a secret compartment, right? No secret compartment. Now, if I am going to perform this famous classic of magic, like any other magician, what would I need? A magic wand. 
a magic wand, you're exactly correct. And so here we go. Here's the wand. And I want you to watch the hat. Watch the hat, watch the hat, watch the hat. Yeah! <laughs> yeah, but you don't see that every day. <laughs> what else have I got in here? Oh, hey. This is interesting. Doesn't have much to do with snakes. But I don't know, with the economy going through it is what it is right now, you know what the worst thing that ever happened to the American dollar was? It was called inflation. <laughs> <laughs> what else do I got in here? Oh, hey, you guys want to see a cobra? Yeah. <laughs> don't see that every day either. No, the guy who had that cobra, I told you I'd tell you that story. The guy who had that cobra had, gosh, he had three cobras, four gaboon vipers, a desert horn viper, a rhinoceros viper, and five kinds of rattlesnakes in a 600 square foot condo in Oak Lawn. Animal control busted the guy. It was just animal control, a cop, the landlord, and me. I found out who he was through the grapevine, sort of, you know. And when we got in there, everybody scattered. I had to take all 14 of those snakes in my van to the Dallas Zoo, uh, enough to kill me about 50 times over. And all the guy got was a ticket for each one of his 14 prohibited animals. 14 tickets, $2,000 each. Yeah, so I don't bring cobras to the libraries. But <laughs> I was recently doing, I told you I did birthday parties, right? I was recently doing a birthday party where they were making craft projects. And they would do, um, well, they would do uh, clay snakes, and they would paint them like milk snakes and, and uh, coral snakes, right? And they did the paper plate snake. You ever done that one? Cut it like a spiral, it hangs like a snake, right? But my favorite was they were making cobras out of old neckties. That's right, they stuck little coat hangers in them, little eyes on them, little tongues. It was very cute. They had a whole table full of them. You haven't lived until you've seen a paisley cobra. So here's my tribute to that. Take this old necktie and roll it up like a snake. Put it on this old-fashioned magician's tray thing, and I want you to pretend that the tray thing is a snake basket, and I'm playing the flute. <laughs> now that is a deadly tie. Yeah, watch this. Down boy. And the crowd goes wild. <laughs> Let's see here. I'm not going to need you this back. Do you want something bigger? Yes. Yeah. Uh, who can tell me why did the anaconda cross the road? To swallow a famous chicken. I was going to say to get to his anaconda. Yeah. <laughs> That's another one of my lines. Thanks, kid. <laughs> Somebody remembers my show. I never saw it. You never saw my show before? Thought you told me on the way in your head. <laughs> yeah, I used to own an anaconda. His name was Andy. And yep, we called his cage the Andy Condo. Um, Andy had a behavioral problem. Andy wanted to bite you. And if Andy was not allowed to bite you, Andy got frustrated. And when Andy got frustrated, Andy pooped. And Andy could poop nine feet. So Andy got a new home. But yeah, no, the, um, uh, the fact is that this is not an anaconda. By the way, you know the real reason that the original chicken crossed the original road? You know? to prove to the possum and the armadillo that it could be done. This is where I usually tell the kids they're a tough crowd. And I'll say something like, um, all right, you know who Batman and Robin are? You know what they call Batman and Robin after the Batmobile was hit by a train? Flatman and Ribbon. Made me giggle for a half hour when I was seven. All right. <laughs> Here we go. This is where it gets difficult. Mm. 
And this is also why I kind of brought a special um, extra thing to do for this show. And it's because, well, because we got no audience. Um, and because we can't really file past the table and pet the snake like we always would here. Gosh, the, uh, the line that I start at Wataga usually takes an hour and a half after I'm done to work all the way through. Um, but hey, you know, I always over deliver. <laughs> but at any rate, does anybody know where the small country of Myanmar is? Somewhere not in the United States. Very good. Since Southeast Asia, very good. What did Myanmar used to be called, Mr. Librarian? <laughs> it used to be called Burma, land of shaving cream. But you got to be really old to get that joke. Um, from Burma, I give you the Burmese python. But even if you went to the jungles of Burma, you would never find this snake. Do you know why? Because he's right here. No, there's another reason. You would never even see a snake that looked like him in the wild. Because he never would have grown to be this big. Long ago, something would have eaten him. Because he would have stuck out like a sore thumb. Because this is a genetic mistake. This is called amelanistic. This is lousy camouflage. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Where are you going to hide in the jungle? you look like this. There's usually at least one kid that says, in a banana tree. And I'm like, have you ever seen an 11 foot banana? Have you ever seen a 55 pound banana? Oh yes, he's a good boy though. He's a total sweetheart. His name is Neon. He's an absolute puppy dog with scales. I always tell people they're freaking out about him that, you know, are not sure they want to touch him. I'm like, look, first of all, for the ladies, he feels like a really expensive purse. But second of all, the ones that are all worried about his head, that's not the dangerous end. If this end begins to grow, be per careful where you point it. I was once, will you ease up on the hat, please? No. I was once at a kid's five-year birthday party when this very snake got me from this shoulder to that foot, and that was the highlight of the show. They got to see the snake man get pooped on. And when you're five, it just doesn't get any better than that. And the reason it's such a big deal. <laughs> Have you ever looked at a bird's feet? Right? It's not skin, it's scales, right? Snakes and birds are closely related. So when this animal poops, it's about like a 55 pound bird. Wow. We're talking ostrich poop. Yeah. Snake poop is bird poop that didn't fall very far. All right, here we go. As for our new experiment, something I've never actually done in one of my shows for the audience. But I know he is going to be happy about it because he has been complaining about this problem. All right, come on, get where everybody can see you. He's out. I know you haven't been out in a while, and I want to run, but I've got something for you. Check it out, check it out, check it out. Look what I've got. One large rat. I'm not kidding. Now, yes, the rat is dead. But in this case, no, the rat is not frozen. I just happened to drop by my rodent supplier today. They, they breed them. These are domestic. They're for lab rats and they're for feed animals, right? Um, they live a happy life. They eat a really good diet and then they get put humanely down with carbon dioxide. So they go to sleep before they're ever dead. Now here's what's gonna be interesting is, first of all, see if I can get the bag open here. Here we go. Neon. Are you ready for a rodent? Are you ready for a rodent? Now, here is where you don't do this. That would be an SFE, you know what that is? A stupid feeding error. Because the one thing that he does with a lot of speed and aggressiveness is eat. Wow. <laughs> so, we can continue to watch him slowly consume this uh, while I tell you more about him. 
Um, actually, uh, he, he just caught, it's, it's an interesting thing because even though I gave it to him, you notice head first. That's a very, very important thing. But he still, because snakes have pretty lousy aim, he still managed to catch it just to one side of the nose, which means he may or may not actually get his mouth functionally around the head to continue swallowing it. If he does not, then inevitably he will let go and try to reposition, at which point he will forget where the rat is. And he will call all over the place, right over the rat. He won't know where it is until I give it back to him again. I have given him the same rat five times before. It's happened. <laughs> so yeah. You have him good? Yeah, you see what I mean? Just a little bit off the, uh, the center on the head. Now you'll notice he's constricting, even though the animal's already dead, but that's his natural behavior. They don't actually crush the, uh, the bones of the animal they eat. They, they grab it, they throw a, a loop on either side. They constrict uh, to take up the slack when the animal breathes out. So every time they breathe out, they squeeze a little bit tighter and eventually they don't even suffocate. It eventually normally stops the heart once you get it squeezed down to that far. The blood can't pump anymore. And so the, the animal, yeah, look, he's trying to reposition. Uh-huh. That is huge. Isn't that wild? The, the, uh, the jaws can articulate really, really wide. I mean, imagine if you could drop your chin way down here and swallow a watermelon whole. That's lunch from a snake's point of view, okay? So, uh, yeah, you're getting a little better, right? Look at you. You got repositioned. Good boy. You got it, Leon. Yeah, he's got it. So, um, <laughs> now, the, the funny part is uh, if we get there by the time the show's over, um, what I always say right when he gets to just this, you know, he's at the end of the wrap, I'm like, okay, now, don't forget to floss with the tail. At any rate, he's... Um, He's a good boy, he's a good eater, he was just, he was acting like uh, when I opened the cage this morning to bring him here, he's like, I'm really hungry. I'm like, okay, we're going past Fort Worth anyway, we'll go buy more rodents. <laughs> so I actually uh, told him this time, because I, I bought frozen ones too, but I said, can you give me just one that's put down properly but isn't frozen? He said, sure. So I got my little one wrap. So, having a good time. Look so at you. How, how long does it take? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing we may actually go longer than we want to watching him swallow it. Um, the um, the answer is as long as it takes him. You know, it's usually not all that long. Um, but uh, and it also depends on whether or not he has to reposition or any of that. Um, and sometimes he'll he'll end up with the barrier he's about to hit, which is he's got a tight wrap around the rat, but his head's about to get to that spot. So unless he can unlatch, unlatch a little bit. He won't be able to eat through his own loop, you know what I mean? I've, I've seen him do that and give up. So, um, snakes have a kind of intelligence. <laughs> it's not an impressive kind. Um, not only that, but uh, the reason I was talking about SFEs earlier, remember he's got heat sensing pits on his upper lip. Uh, just like a, a rattlesnake has little pits, he's got big ones right around his upper lip. And he can see in the dark. He sees heat. So uh, he can see you blink in a pitch black eye room from the heat of your eyelids, right? So um, if you're dumb enough to dangle the rat from your hand, if the rat's not warmer than the hand, which one do you think that smell? He's going to think that smell is coming from. You know what I mean? Because his tongue can smell very accurately what's in front of him. In fact, a dog smells about a thousand times more accurately than we do. A snake does it about 10,000 times better than we do. The tongue is forked because it can tell, it can smell in stereo. It can tell when the trail goes cold on the left or cold on the right. So they're way better than a bloodhound at following the scent trail to get to the prey. So how are we doing down there? I told you you're about to hit your own body. Unless you let go, you won't be able to get past it. What happened? Well, he's got, no, I'm sorry, what's the question? What happened if you tried to... Oh, well, if I try to un unwrap him, which um, might work, but it might also upset him enough that he'll puke the rat and then we got to start over again. Oh. You know what I mean? It's not that hard to, uh, to get a snake to, uh, to regurgitate. As a matter of fact, that's why uh, right after, this is something I would never do in my normal show mm -hmm. because everybody was going to want to come pet him. Mm -hmm. And if he's just eating a rat, That'll be a really good way to get the rat back, you know what I mean? And there's nothing quite so yucky 
as a partly digested snake meal. They have extremely good digestive juices that can digest hair and bones and teeth, no problem. Comes out looking like bird poop, all right? So they eat everything whole, um, and the, but they don't swallow it alive, or at least a constrictor never will. Now we've got smaller snakes here in, here in Texas, for instance, a little sleek snake in your yard is the Eastern Yellow Belly Racer. And he eats things alive because he's not a constrictor and he's got no venom. All he can do is gobble down things that are small enough to overpower. So he'll eat a small mouse, he'll eat a, a cricket, a roach, a grasshopper, a smaller snake, a lizard, anything small enough to overpower. But it's funny too because I, I remember feeding a um, garter snake the same way. Uh, I remember a garter snake was um, especially fond of minnows, right? So I go to the bait store, I get him minnows, put them in his water dish, and watch him struggle with the minnows, right? But the hilarious thing is, a minnow doesn't suffocate immediately, right? So the snake would get the minnow all the way swallowed, and about, you know, a third of the way down, and he'd be crawling along and the minnow would go twitch. <laughs> it was very interesting to watch. <laughs> so um, how are we doing? Are we halfway there yet? But look, you're gonna have to let go of that loop. The loop's in the way, big dude. You're not going to be able to get past it unless you let go. You're not going to be able to do it. I don't know. Maybe he thinks he can squeeze it out of there with his own body. I don't know. You just about hit the barrier, dude. <laughs> I knew this was going to be weird trying to do this on camera. Uh, all right. Well, let me tell you uh, the, uh, the finishing thing to my story anyway. Because he's probably going to be a little while. And I don't know, maybe what we could do um, when he gets all the way down to the end of it, we could take a, another minute or two to watch him finish it. Because I don't think we're going to want to wait that long. How, how much time have we been? Yeah, well, at any rate, um, this particular thing has to do, well, first of all, part of my story is why I do this, all right? When I was in my great-grandmother's backyard when I was seven years old, I found my first snake. Now, this is not actually my very first snake, but they, I, the, one, the story they tell me, I can't remember. I was too young. Apparently, my father was about to kill the snake that I found, and I melted down. <laughs> and so, he did not kill the snake. <laughs> and that was the beginning of that. I don't remember that story, but they tell me that's what happened. But in my great-grandmother's backyard, I found this beautiful little speckled king snake. It was only about this long, it was a little, you know, juvenile. And he was gorgeous, little yellow speckles down his back, and shiny black snake. And he was so gentle, when I put my hand in front of him, he crawled up on my hand. And when I picked up my hand, he wrapped around my finger. And in a few minutes, he wrapped around my heart. But about two hours later, I killed him. I didn't mean to. I didn't know. I was a little kid. I thought you put him in the jar with the holes in the lid, and you leave him in the car for a little while in the summertime in Jackson, Mississippi. My dad had parked in the shade, but the shade moved and the snake fried. And I was so horrified that I had harmed this little animal that the first place we had to go when we got back to Texas was the library. I had to read every book I could get my hands on about snakes. I had grown-ups reading me books I could not read yet about snakes because I not only wanted to never kill another snake again, I wanted to stop everybody else from killing me. I've been making it up to that one snake my whole life. And one more story. And this has to do with my father. See, part of the reason I use humor in my show is my father actually kind of taught me how to be funny. Um, I don't know, maybe it's hereditary, I don't know. But uh, he and I used to love to joke at the dinner table, right? In fact, mostly what we would do is, uh, is word jokes. We love puns and stuff like that. And sometimes he and I would go back and forth so fast that my mother and my sister would just sit there shaking their heads. But the reason this reminds me of Dad is, you know, there are things that once you do them are really hard to undo. Like if you tie a knot in one of these things, especially if you tie it really, really tight, 
that's going to be very hard to undo, right? And it reminds me of the, the problem that we have that 80% of our wildlife is gone. It seems like a, an unfixable problem, a knot you can't untie. But the reason this reminds me of Dad was my father and I were, were, we were building a shed in the backyard, right? And he was so good at it, we didn't even need plants. We just built it. It was great. <laughs> yeah. He's like, give me one of those. Well, um, but as we're starting to put up just the last part, which is the outside walls of the shed, right? All those long boards, they all had holes in them. <laughs> I saw a joke coming. <laughs> I said, Dad, what are these holes? He said, well, son, those are not holes. I said, Dad, if they're not holes, what are they? Now, you didn't laugh, but he did. <laughs> Maybe some of you at home did. But he also gave me a wink that was possibly the best attaboy I ever got. And you know what? My father's name was George. And you know what else? Sometimes a hope is not. Is not. And you guys were awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Watauga. Thank you, Watauga Library. Coolest place in Watauga. I can't wait for everything to get back to where everybody can go. But you can still come here. You can check out books. There's all kinds of stuff online. You see all these books behind me. There's a wealth of knowledge to be had. Do not fail to avail yourself of that resource. Libraries are the last bastion of some of what we call normal. Please keep them alive. <laughs> and thanks again, everyone. And remember to break for snakes. And remember, if I don't make it home, I will make the news. Are you done? Look, he's almost done. Look, he's almost done. We're almost at, uh, at uh, floss with the tail moment. <laughs> yes, all he got is two back legs and a tail right now. But look, did you notice he just loosened up enough where he could actually pull it backwards? Yeah, look he's at you. So slow. Look at you. Well, he's having to. He's literally having to move his yeah. teeth around it. They don't chew and swallow. They engulf. Yep. The teeth curve inward so the food doesn't slide back out. So that's really all he's doing is he's gradually on one side and then the other moving over the food. And peristalsis won't take over until he gets almost a hair. You know what I mean? From there, all he's doing is he's wiggling like this to move it down. Yeah, look at that. We're almost at floss with the tail moments. That's awesome. We got to have the whole thing happen during the show. How many did they? How many? Yeah. Oh no, it's not a day. No, a big meal to him is four of these in one day, and he's good for a week or two. No, they eat a big meal and sit on it. I mean, that's what a big constrictor does. Now, in fact, yeah. Um, isn't that cool? I um. I wish I could get him to eat rabbits because it would be more economical. One big rabbit instead of four big rats, or five or six, you know. But uh, he uh, doesn't like rabbit flavor. His predecessor did, but I guess rabbits are just not your thing, are they? Look at you! That's like a yawn with a rat in it. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. You're doing a great job. I have never done this on any show, you guys. <laughs> I've had people ask me, will you feed him a rat? And I'm like, no, you're about to pet this snake. I can't do that. I don't want to put the rat back in your hand. <laughs> what a big boy you are. Look at that. Oh, we're almost, you got it. We're on, almost you got to flossing with it. the tail. Come on. There we go. That's pretty impressive, dude. That was a big boy. Oh, it came back. Don't forget to floss. <laughs> this face right now looks like he's just like I know, so I know. happy. Yeah, that's a smile, isn't it? Yeah, it totally is. And you'll see him using his neck muscles to move oh. it further down. Oh, yeah. That's a big gulp. <laughs> you don't see that every day. No, you don't. Ladies and gentlemen, Neon. <laughs> And his jumbo rat. There it is, the last bit of the tail. One big final gulp. Come on. Oh, you got it. And there it goes. I guess we could call this experiment a success. Yeah, it is. Thanks, everybody. See you around at the library.